Good afternoon. I'm Paul Goldberger, the architecture critic of The New Yorker, and I'm delighted to welcome Zaha Hadid here this afternoon. Her, her basic biographical details are in your program, so I'll start out by just saying that there are always a few architects who manage by the power of their work or the power of their personality to transcend the inward-looking world of architecture and become figures in the culture in general. And Zaha Hadid is surely one of these figures today. Uh, while it's true that there's no other architect, so far as I know, who is named Zaha, so these days you often hear her referred to only by her first name, sort of like Sting or Prince or something. <laughs> I think there's no doubt, though, that however memorable a presence she is, it is really the power of her work that has given her her extraordinary stature. From the time she burst into public view in 1983 with an extraordinary project for Hong Kong called The Peak, to her built work, which runs from the Vitra Fire Station in Basel, Switzerland in the early 90s, right up through an extraordinary BMW building in Leipzig and the Science Museum in Wolfsburg and numerous other projects which we'll talk about. All of these things have confirmed the visual and conceptual power of her work. Her architecture is neither meek nor conventional, but it's deeply connected to human reality, to social interaction, and to emotional engagement. Anyway, today, of course, we're here to look forward, not backward, and to talk about where architecture will be going, with particular attention to 2012, a year that seems wildly futuristic, but is rather terrifyingly only five years away. Zaha has an extraordinary amount of work right now, much of it focused, in fact, on the year 2012, most prominently her project for the London Olympics, and she designed an important piece of the New York City 2012 Olympics proposal, which of course did not happen. Let's start though talking about that. Can you tell us a little bit about the Olympics project and what it's about? Uh, well, in London we're doing um, Aquatic Center, which is mm -hmm. uh, uh, shown here, which, uh, which is basically um, uh, all the kind of uh, pools and of course the swimming is one of the first, all the water activities are first uh, to inaugurate the Olympic uh, Games. Uh, this is in a in an area in London, which is in East London, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is called the Lee Valley, and it has a, it's a regeneration program as well, so it's kind of combines this Olympic uh, uh, mode and later on to become a pavilion in the park when it's, when it's, when it's kind of an animation showing as you kind of really fly over uh, the, the project. It's basically fundamentally like a wave, Originally, it was two waves. There's an Olympic mode, and the idea that after the Olympic, it kind of will, will not shrink in size. So part of it is temporary structure, so that in the what they call legacy mode, where it becomes part of the kind of the city, it becomes you know more sustainable and more easy to kind of deal with. So it's kind of two waves. This is after the Olympics, where the seating is taken away and mm -hmm. replaced by the glazing and, as a pavilion in the park. So it's being built pretty much as we see it now. Well, they're working on the site, and it's a very difficult site. It's kind of, Lee Valley is kind of like a swamp, and it has a lot of waterways, and they, so I think there's a tremendous amount of infrastructure which has to take place mm -hmm. on that site. Right, right. The Olympics have actually been an extraordinary sort of source of architectural patronage, it seems to me, in recent years, given that you also did a New York project and uh, you didn't do anything in Beijing, though, did you, no, for those of them? No, no, no. Okay. Um, I know you're also doing major work right now in Abu Dhabi, in Moscow, in Glasgow, in Spain, um, indeed, in almost every major city but New York, it would seem. Um, but let's, be, before and, we, before we get into too much of the failings of New York uh, here, uh, let's talk for a moment just about the whole... Just by the way, oh, this is the Olympics yeah. uh, housing project for the Olympics in New York. I mean, it's opposite the United Nations. It was on the, the Olympic Village site Olympic in Village Queens. Site, yes. yeah. Yeah. Um, and this is one of the first towers we actually worked on. Um, anyway. And I should point out, this was 
accepted. It was not that this project was not accepted. It was the entire New York bid lost out to yeah, London. Yeah. Right. But had the New York bid won, this would have been built. Um, not necessarily this one, no, but, uh, but some version. We, of we it. didn't really win it, but. Okay. Uh, okay, it would not have been built. But I mean, I think that site is yeah. still available for a, another project, which I think is our main one, um, to 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 be built. Because I think the whole idea of housing uh, right. in any kind of major city that you know you can. There's always sort of uh, living accommodation, mm -hmm. and I think that what was interesting about the side was that it's a kind of, we use the idea of the double ground, which we have developed for 20 years about how the ground, you know, could be used for, in this case, kind of parking instead of digging, and that over the ground there's kind of like a, a, an inflated landscape becomes where all the kind of, uh, you know, training and restaurants are and, and stuff like that, and also around the towers as they land, because this is kind of, reverse of the, because this was not generated as a kind of a, a, kind of, um, a commercial site, that the footprint is very small, but the surrounding area becomes where all the kindergarten and the schools are, so it's immediate to the towers. Right. Right. Great. So let's talk for a moment about this whole idea of global architecture, given that you're doing work all over the world. What does it mean today for an architect to be based anywhere? You know, is there such a thing as regional design, as national design, or is there only international? Well, I'm sure, I'm sure there is uh, regional, because I think that one always forgets that I think that, that these kind of things still exist somewhere lurking around. Um, I think what is interesting is that there could be idea which could apply, be applied globally, but I think that what is interesting for us anyway, I think that size and local conditions could Inspire, inspire you, mm -hmm. or must begin the side to inspire you to do things which are quite unique. And I think the last 20, 30 years, as, let's say when we have one question, ideas of typology and kind of regionalism and so on like that, vernacular, I think what came out of that is another uh, kind of different kind of order, and I think that implies also re-looking at idea of context. Right. And I think, that what, so these shifts, and kind of parameters of context and, and kind of locale, mm -hmm. uh, in a sense, and typology generated another kind of work which was um, different from the early modernist work, which was about repetition, mass production, and so on, and made much more customized. And I think that it's much more, uh, it's much easier now to kind of deal. And I think this can stem down from our case, uh, which, which is dealing with the historic city, mm -hmm. uh, a European city, which had uh, very different, again, conditions and the idea that in each case one can customize. And this came also from ideas of juxtapositions mm -hmm. and, you know, and also looking at deformation and all these things. And it came with, with a much more customized, but actually they could also become a generic project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For example, the Wellsburg project, which is on the screen now, came out from a very specific That's kind of... science museum. Science Wolfsburg, museum. Yeah. Wolfsburg, very con conditioned on this side. It is kind of a post-PLOT, lifting the building up on PLOT. And this was the idea of combining mm -hmm. like this big cone structure with program mm -hmm. together to create a kind of an event space on the ground which becomes part of the urban thing. So I think uh, urbanism, whether it's uh, adjacent to the building under the building or inside the building becomes a very, you know, really, I think, crucial context for a lot of this new work. And that, I think, that's the, the connecting tissue, let's say, of what I call what could be global architecture, because I think in every cultural program uh, or housing, one needs to look at these urban, urban urbanization. But I think, I think the key point you made, if I get it right, is that technology today doesn't require us to do the standardization that was thought to be the goal of technology in the early modern period. In fact, we're actually liberated from standardization now. Uh, I mean, I think it's, it's more like uh, in the last 10 years, I think uh, technology, uh, one can customize everything. Yes. Uh, I think that is the next generation of the whole input of computing and uh, computer mm -hmm. generated technology into the way a computation can actually material uh, invention of materiality, um, invention and, you know, the connection between, uh, you know, prototyping and that would become the next, uh, I think, um, phase of tremendous interest. But I think that the early period was, was also looking at really how one can actually com 
look at different ways of regenerating influence on the site. And mm -hmm. I think it really came from uh, observing, for example, you take Berlin, mm -hmm. where in, in the early days of it was, there was this thing that every building has to be a perimeter block, but that implies a perimeter block uh, within the perimeter block is a sealed environment. It's a kind of a closed system of, in terms of composition and organization. Mm -hmm. And I think the defining moment is to do with organization. And when I started with, with the idea of fragmentation and how fragmentation eventually led to fluid space, and that also implied a degree of porosity of the ground. Because I think part of the modernist project was a, not all of it, but kind of really lo not looking at the ground in the way we actually now in cities could look at it. And the whole issue of the ground project led to intensity and also uh, densification, let's say, but also porosity, that the ground is open. And not in the same way as predicted in the early part of the 20th century, but, but with event space program in it. I mean, it's like, you know, you can say this, this building accommodates this idea of event space. So you can have, you know, a much porous, much porous ground. You've anticipated, actually, a question I was going to ask you, which is your, your work was known for a long time for very sharp, acute angles. Uh, and now seems to be characterized by a much more fluid sense. And well, I think, I think if you look at Wolfsburg, it has both. Um, mm -hmm. I'm sorry, I'm holding my ear all the time because I have a very strange thing attached to it. Uh, <laughs> uh, I apologize. Um, but, uh, no, I think if you look at Wolfsburg, it has both. Mm -hmm. The ground, which deals uh, with the morphology of the ground, is much more fluid. And as you lift up and mm -hmm. you have a restraint kind of, you know, space is much more angular. I think the whole fragmentary nature of the early work and the lightness, and because there was an obsession on my part because of the way we land, which 20 years later or 30 years later translated into a tremendous interest in structure mm -hmm. and how structure can actually um, create space and experience which is different uh, and, and also uh, so lightness, the way it lands on the ground. And I think that now we have an ambition about kind of dealing with fluid space or fluid kind of on different scales. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just before lunch, um, in, just before lunch in uh, a presentation on sustainability and, and green uh, design of all kinds, including food, uh, we saw uh, housing designs uh, for the Katrina uh, disaster and that were very conventional and traditional little little cottages, and they were presented as uh, valuable in not only because they can be built quickly and cheaply, but because people liked them and understood them and identified with them, uh, were, were the words, in fact, of the architect. Um, your work is, of course, in, in great contrast to that. It does not look conventional or like a traditional image of a house. Um, can you talk to that for a little bit? Do you feel that people uh, need that or, in fact, does doing that hold back the art and not allow us to advance in a certain way? Well, I think that, um, you know, um, I mean, maybe not many of you know that I was a student of Leo Creers in the, ah. my third year. And uh, before he kind of really, I think, I think about him now again because I was at Yale and, mm -hmm. you know, so he's teaching there as well, not the semester, but um, I, I really, and it was not a reaction to him, but um, uh, and the year I was a student, uh, he kind of, at the beginning of that year, he was kind of, uh, let's say, not so uh, violent against modernity. Right. And by the end of that year, uh, he kind of really, his shift to quite, the historicism became much more apparent. Right. Uh, and and I, I really did not think that, um, I mean, if you are in third and fourth year, you're not, you know, you don't have a kind of ideology necessarily, necessarily but I did not believe that progress has, uh, should stop. Right. And I, I, I really thought, and I, and I was, and that's why in my fourth year I joined Elias and Gellis and Ramkolas as teachers because I really thought uh, the modern tradition mm -hmm. uh, was uh, valid, but also if we take that on as the next project and um, push it, uh, and I did not accept that there was no progress in architecture. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So I think that there is one which is to do with the idea of um, uh, kind of uh, using, kind of inventing new repertoires and pushing the envelope within the field. There's another thing which is I think that uh, we live in a very different kind of world. 
uh, you know, the client, there are many clients, you know, they have their, the city as a client, you have the population as a client, and I think they require and need certain degree of invention, uh, and mm -hmm. also, not everybody is, uh, let's say, lucky mm -hmm. to travel and see the world and enjoy all this thing, and I think that we are responsible uh, to make this, uh, you know, available to many more people. Right. In terms of education, in terms of uh, housing and living. Uh, so I think that, that was another layer that, you know, to invent a kind of, um, not a, a wow effect for the civic, but to invent a kind of a, like a landscape or wilderness that people can enjoy. Now people are very resistant to idea of, they call it iconic, but it's not necessarily iconic, to a kind of really dazzling things. Right. And, but nobody would ever, you know, criticize people who are going to the landscape or making trips to strange uh, places because, because they take landscape for granted. So that's one other ambition, which is how to really deal with very large programs, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in terms of enormous kind of program, like shopping centers and in large podiums, in terms of reconfigure them as a topography. Mm -hmm. You know, and that of course meant a different kind of, uh, a very different rules. And that's what I'm talking about, you know, uh, in a fluid, fluid space. I think also the issue of housing and, you know, mm -hmm. and, and New Orleans and stuff like that, I don't think there is one single method to apply right. what is possible. Now, I think that there should be an ambition by the city to do something really great about what, what would become its new matrix. Right. You know, what should occupy the ground of our very large areas and how that should reflect on future you know, life if that could enable or you know, make it possible that we th the ambition of future life in that side. And then we have to think about ways of what can, how we can make repetitive pieces which are you know, you know, maybe irreasonable to build in the circumstance. Right. I mean, for example, people forget in London that after the war they had to build very fast and to accommodate all the people who are displaced. When we look back, they criticize that period because it was done cheaply and so on. So I think one has to kind of learn from the past experiences. I mean, I don't know whether you went to the Venice Biennale and, mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, the, the, all the kind of imagery which is to do with favelas and shanty towns. And you come out of it thinking, what exactly is the, is the message? Right. Is the message that, you know, it's okay because it's, it looks nice, because it's not nice to be in a shanty town? No, no, actually, there's something very patronizing, actually, about that. But I think what they, they are saying is that there could be, because these are done in an organic way, yes. that maybe that future work in the series should be developed organically. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it has a different kind of strategy. It is not rigid. I mean, that's my, maybe that's the message. Because it cannot be that the message is that, you know, it's very nice to live in a favela, you know. Of course, now, you know, they have resorts in the favelas to get people there because it's interesting. But it's not. I mean, it's interesting only to look at right. from a distance. But it's not interesting to be living in a, in a slum. And I don't think it should be, uh, you know, promoted. But I think if one can say that organic system of organization can actually lead to growth in the city, in a different kind of way, uh, then I think that's fine. That's what maybe they can be saying about uh, New Orleans, that you can have a growth which is, you know, which is built in, that it's not necessarily massive, it's not mega structures, but actually small units yes. which can grow. But that doesn't have to be kind of, uh, you know, looking like, a, you know, like a dog kennels or right, right, so on. Right. Right. Not, not, I haven't seen the presentation, but, yeah. but there is a kind of a push by what I call the pragmatist, uh, not meaning pragmatic, uh, kind of, uh, to, to push for very restrained yes. work with no exuberance. And, you know, I think some areas it could be okay. Uh, but I think that it's important to also to kind of to push the field, I feel. Yes, and, and, and both are necessary, really. In a way, They're both necessary. it's also the, the contrast between foreground and background architecture, yes. right? Which, and both, both are needed in a way. Um, you've talked a lot about the city. Let's talk for a moment about public space. Um, how do you think it is evolving with new kinds of building, new kinds of technology? Uh, are there public spaces that you yourself have done that you feel uh, push the frontiers of how we would define public space today? 
Yeah, I think that uh, the idea of public space and then last, uh, I think that, you know, of course, the model was always Italy, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, you know, and I think that the whole postmodern period in America and Europe, they were always looking at kind of San Marco and, you know, Bologna and kind of the, the plaza uh, in, Italian, in the Italian context. Mm -hmm. And the same, I think, with all the historicist work. Uh, the, you know, but I think um, what evolved was that, you know, I think especially in the, uh, in the European cities and I think in the American city, mm -hmm. where, you know, doesn't, where there does not always permit to be, you know, lounging around all day and drinking. Like, like the Italians it, do, it right. It could be very right. nice. Right. So I think, <laughs> and they are very beautiful. Yes. And I think that, that I think that the whole idea through, uh, through this research came out that there is a necessity to actually, um, let's say, multiply civic space mm -hmm. within the Western city, in a sense, and, and also in, in a hot environment like in Asia and stuff like that. So, so the idea of multiplicity of ground, which I say, I mean, the whole idea of the public space started with the peak as a mm -hmm. suspended space above ground, and then the idea that, you know, you can... I mean, you have it here in New York, like in the Rockefeller Center, all the atria, you know, maybe some of them are a bit cheesy, but the point is there was an ambition at that point yeah. to create or carve out, you know, public space. And so I think that's what we did for a long period of time as research, how we can do that. And so the multiplicity of ground, many layers of the projects could hold public and civic projects. Mm -hmm. The other strategy was to kind of make it much more open and porous and to move away from a closed system as opposed to an open system, which brings in more people, and then to kind of use devices, which are very simple, to draw people in into a building, like in Cincinnati, for example, the idea of the urban carpet and the transparency on the ground can build people, the idea in Wolfsburg to, to, to inhabit the cones and make them all like a mini urbanism on the ground, which has, you know, sh you know a shops and and, and stuff like that, and to kind of really occupy the higher datum for exhibition. I think what happened in Europe, actually, because of the necessity to do competitions, mm -hmm. because of the law in Europe, in, the, in Europe about public buildings, and also the investment in Europe, by the community in public spaces, like, you know, public squares or museums, mm -hmm. in, 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 enhance and enrich that process, that's a possibility to actually make, uh, make these projects. So I think that, for example, um, well, this is a bridge we're doing uh, in Saragossa, which, which uh, for example, is a public bridge, which is an expo. So combining bridging and expo. So hybrid programs also began to emerge through these ambitions in Europe, where this is kind of combining two programs uh, at the same time, uh, and it eventually becomes a public space. Uh, all the um, master plans we're doing and, uh, in Singapore, which is mm -hmm. already underway, and, Zerago, and, and Bilbao is also underway, and the new one in Istanbul, which actually predicts that you can also, you know, you oscillate between occupying the street as a building and creating a kind of a, a, an open domain. Of course, all parks and things like that are necessary spaces. Right. But I think in terms of a a compressed building, and no matter how small it is, you can actually create a public program. Right, good. Let's talk about those master plans for a moment. Um, what, what will make uh, the section of Singapore you're doing, or Bilbao, uh, in your plan different from the urban fabric that now exists there? Well, in Singapore, it's very simple. I mean, the existing kind of topology in Singapore is to have a very large podium. It's completely... Uh, inver inter inverted, inverted comes, everything happens within a building, and there's a tower. Mm -hmm. And this very large plan, which is an existing park, so we have to occupy an existing park with a new, it was, let's say, the barracks for the British Army. Uh, so when they left, some of the buildings kind of disappeared, some of them are stayed because they're actually nice typology. And they call them black and white because they were black and white building. Mm -hmm. I mean, it looked like stripes. And anyway, so the idea was to occupy the type, topography of the park 
with another topography, mm -hmm. and like this one. And, but it was against the, it was, we, we did it as a kind of a challenge to the idea of the podium and tower. Right. And these are, so you can occupy one of these plots, or five, or seven, or eight. So they become, because it's mostly like a technology hub, biomedical research and so on. And so you can have a, a kind of a campus. This is not done by us, but this is part of the envelope we provided for the other architects to work within, uh, that master plan, and the idea that you can connect these buildings. So it's a very different diagram. So the idea was, in this case, to create a kind of community of research where people can actually, you know, uh, uh, cross each other on the street. There could be life on the street. There's a street pattern. Uh, you know, there is smaller streets, larger streets. And the other idea was uh, sorry, to, to look at the idea of the soft grid, that you can actually connect two sides of the city mm -hmm. through the park, uh, through a kind of, a, let's say, a soft grid, uh, which connects them both. Some of that uh, plan for Singapore, we, uh, I remember from the very first image we saw of it, this one or, or the, the other one looked like a very dense web of an almost a traditional or pre-modern city. Yeah, I mean, it is. It has some it, of those qualities. I, I mean, I think it also we look, the reason I think it's so dense is because, I mean, that we left the park, for example, as a park, part of it, but the idea was kind of to create a topography which can undulate between 30 stories and right. very small size. Mm -hmm. Because then you can, it could be occupied by very large companies or housing or offices to very small, like single unit or a small company to kind of allow a variety and also that it actually also because it has to grow incrementally. So you, if you build, let's say, 15 of these blocks, you can almost have an occupied out of a city mm -hmm. as opposed to you might have one single building in a large site. So that was right. because it, is, it will be done over 25 years. So the idea that the growth is organic. Organic over, and like a web. Yeah, really, uh, over time. Yes. yes. Yeah, I understand. Um, let me ask about a couple of specific projects in the couple of minutes we, we have left. Um, very, very different from the things we've talked about so far is something like the Puerto America Hotel in Madrid, where you did a hotel, a tourist hotel that is uh, unusual, striking, and has sections done by many other architects as well. Can you talk about that a little bit? Well, I think the idea of actually making a hotel with many different architects on different floors was interesting. But the most interesting part for me was uh, to use this new technology. This was done by with LG Hymax, which is like a Korean. Uh, all the technology is now, which is to do with production, is done through milling technique. So you mill uh, the mill the form, and through heat, thermal heating, you can vacuum form the LG Hymax or the Korean on this. So, so what you can have is a completely fluid interior. You don't see any joints. I mean, because they're filled in and sanded, and you can add to them, you don't see the additions. So you can have a completely kind of fluid environment. And also we do that with a lot of the furniture. We're designing yeah. same technology, milling, and then clad with fiberglass. And also we use the technology to build the Wolfsburg project. In terms mm -hmm. of the formwork for the concrete, because now you can also through the same, through computing, mill all the formwork, and they become the way you pour uh, the concrete. For example, this is a kitchen done with Corian, which is also about future use where it's all kind of you have smells, you know, in the room or same technology doing a handbag for BB Tom. It's all to do with milling, milling or rapid uh, prototyping. Uh, the car, which is oh, kind yeah. of... Tell no, us about the car. No emission, eco-friendly car, which is three wheels. Also, uh, the model was done for the same. I, actually, technology, to go back... It's very similar to the kind of the idea of the body of the car being made through vacuum forming, like a kind of formed. So I think there's a connection between now because this kind of technology is going back to the building industry. And actually we're doing a project in Innsbruck now, which is on the other side of the ski jump, mm -hmm. on the mountain where everything is done uh, through heating the glass. And it's very kind of, as I said, it's not about repetition, but it's very specific to this product. So you can, this, this kind of form is done through, you know, of course, analyzing the kind of geometry, and now it's done through a glass, which is kind of molded specifically uh, for these projects. And this is something, all of these things we've just been looking at are things that, that could not have been done a few years ago, right? I mean, I'm sure they could have been done, but with tremendous expense and 
complexity. And not and mass think, produced, really. No, and I think now one can deal with complexity in a much uh, easier way through the technology. And also, uh, yeah, I mean, analysis of the, uh, of the pieces is, becomes much easier. It can deal with, right. with complexity much easier and, and yeah. in, a, in a much more exciting way as well. Wonderful. Wonderful. So, uh, thank you so much. Thank you. For being here. Thank, thank you, you all. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm.